Great, thank you so much for joining us today for the Vantage Seminar. And this is part of the series of talks on rational points and Manin's conjecture. And today, we're really happy to have Will Sawin speaking on the freeness alternative to thin sets in Manin's conjecture. And uh, Will, is it okay if we video your talk today? Yep. Yeah, great. Well, thank you and, um, and go right ahead. All right. So, uh, if, um, Marta in her talk gave a great uh, introduction to like the, the formulation of Manin's conjecture. Uh, so if you went to that talk, that's great. And if not, I'm gonna give a quick review of like the most important parts for what I'm going to say. So we're going to be working with uh, smooth projective fauna varieties. These are varieties where the anti-canonical, the inverse of the canonical line bundle is ample. Uh, and we'll always take them to be defined over the rational numbers. Um, so we're going to look at rational points by their height. Um, I'm going to try to keep things concrete during this talk. So I'll define the, the height as, as concretely as I know how. We're going to choose an embedding of x into the projective n-dimensional space so that each, each point will be given by n plus 1 projective coordinates, which are rational numbers defined up to scaling. By scaling, we can make them all integers and assure they have no common factors. And we'll define the height to be the maximum of the absolute values of these integers. Um, so this height, uh, of course, depends on the choice of embedding. Um, and we can normalize it so it doesn't depend as much on the choice of embedding. If some power of the, the line bundle O of 1 on projective space is equal to some power of the canonical bundle, then we raise our height to the exponent corresponding to these powers, uh, and we'll call it the anti-canonical height. So if O of D is minus E the power of canonical bundle, then we'll raise the height to the power D over E, and we'll call that the anti-canonical height, and that will only depend on the embedding uh, uh, up to a constant. So Menin's conjecture predicts the number of rational points on X whose height is less than t as a function of t. The prediction is going to be a constant times t times the power of log t. Um, and it also, in some formulations, predicts the distribution of those points uh, among the real points of x and also among the piadic points of x in, in those kind of different topologies. Um, and I think this aspect of um, equidistribution is important and sometimes underappreciated. Although it's not going to be the, the main thing about coming up with this. Um, but like these like predictions are like really great um, and it's, they're they're like useful and they're like very interesting, but they're like not always true. We have and so what we do to we just like instead of like being like okay our conjecture is wrong, we just force them to be true by getting rid of all the rational points we don't want. So we remove what's called a thin set of rational points. And after doing that, we believe the conjecture is always true. Um, so what are these thin sets? Uh, this is, um, a thin set is a finite union of certain subsets of the rational points. Uh, and there are two different kinds of subsets that make up thin sets. The, the most straightforward one is we take a subvariety of X all the rational points in that subvariety lie inside a thin set. So that there can be bad subvarieties, which we have to get rid of. And, and the more subtle one is we can have a covering. Our covering will be generically finite map of degree at least two from an irreducible variety. And the rational points in the image of the rational points of that map, or equivalently the rational points that lift to this covering Z uh, will also form a thin set. Um, and so uh, what, we have to remove a thin set. It's not always completely clear what thin set uh, to remove. And until recently, it wasn't even clear that there exists like a reasonable thin set to remove. Um, but Lemon, Sengupta, and, and Tanimoto gave a geometric criterion that this thin set should satisfy and show there's always a finite set of sub varieties and coverings um, satisfying this criterion. 
This uses really recently developed um, algebraic geometry duals to do with boundedness of funnel varieties, and it's not uh, effective. So this is like a very strong result, but it's not as nice a description as we would like of like what this thin chest should be in general. Um, and, and I want to highlight the fact that this is something very strange. So we're going to count rational points, except we're not going to count rational points. We're going to throw out the bad ones. But if you decide whether a rational point is good or bad, you don't just like look at that point and do some simple calculation. Instead, you have to go find, look at all sub varieties of your variety and all coverings of the variety and look at count their like A and B invariants and like figure out which ones are bad and do some complicated like calculation that is not like known to be effectively bounded and come up with this list of like thin of exceptional sub varieties and exceptional coverings. And then you can check does your variety live in this thin set? Does it live, does the irrational point live in this thin set? Does it live in the sub variety or does it lift to, to one of these coverings? Um, so we might hope to do something better. We might hope to have a way of telling whether a rational point is good or bad that you can determine just from looking at this rational point from some kind of like intrinsic geometry of the rational point. Um, and so you might think that like rational points are just points and they don't have any intrinsic geometry. Um, so what I wanna do in like the next part of the talk is explain why that's wrong and explain how we can distinguish like different types of rational points in a way that's meaningful for means conjecture. Should I look at this question? So the way I want to do is I'm going to begin with a very simple special case. And it's even a simple special case of a slightly different problem. So I want to talk about just varieties defined by linear equations instead of the general case of algebraic varieties. And I'm just going to talk, I'm going to talk about kind of integer points instead of rational points. Um, and so another way of thinking about this is we're counting integer points on a lattice. So we're going, to, we're going to define a variety by linear equations. So we're going to choose some vectors y1 through yk in Zn, which will give us equations. And we'll let x be the subset of n-dimensional space where the dot product of x with these vectors y1 through yk all vanishes. This is a general form of a lot variety defined by linear equations. So the question I want to ask, which is like a, a Manin type question, is how many uh, integer points on this variety have norm less than r? How many x uh, that are, lie in z to the n have norm? And I'll take the, the L2 norm that just the length of these vectors less than r and also lie in x. Or satisfy these equations. Um, so uh, what we've done is if you think if you think about trying to generalize Manin's conjecture from rational points on projective varieties to integer points on affine varieties, we're sort of describing the simplest case of that where your affine variety is defined by equations of degree one. So you should think of this length as playing the role of the height in this setting. Um, and you might wonder why this is relevant to the original question we'd asked. Um, and one motivation I can give for why this lattice point counting problem is actually really relevant to um, uh, the original conjecture is that if you look at the proof of almost every case of Manin's conjecture, starting with projective space, at some point the proof is going to reduce to like counting lattice points in some kind of box or some kind of ball. So you do need to understand counting lattice points as like the first step. And so it kind of makes sense to go back to this well if we're thinking about like reformulating the conjecture. So let's talk about this problem. Let's talk about like what should be true. Like what's a, what's a reasonable heuristic answer and when is like that heuristic correct? And that will give us a clue as to uh, what to do in the original problem. So let me just restate the problem. We're counting how many x in z to the n have norm less than r and have dot product with these vectors to be zero. Uh, just to uh, attack this problem, it's natural to say the lattice 
of all vectors in Z to the N with no condition on the, the length, which have these dot products to be zero. Uh, and this lattice will live inside the vector space of vectors in Rn, where all these dot products vanish. Um, and it'll be, they'll both have the same, the same rank. Uh, so let n be the dimension of this vector space, which is also the rank of the lattice, because my equations are defined over the integers. That will always happen. Um, and we'll take Cn will be the volume of the unit of all dimension n. And that will show up in my prediction, heuristic prediction for how many points there should be. So the, the prediction is the number of points in this lattice with norm less than R should be the volume of the unit ball times Rn divided by the volume of this vector space mod the lattice, or the, the volume of the fundamental domain of the lattice. Um, uh, so why is this? Well, the lattice points seem to be very evenly distributed in the vector space V, their density is one per fundamental domain. So the inverse of the volume of the fundamental domain. Uh, and so therefore we expect the number of lattice points in any region should be approximately proportional to the volume of that region with this constant proportionality one to over the volume. And so the volume of a ball of radius R in is Cn times R to the N. So this is a this is a prediction. We can think of it as being like a Monin type prediction, where like you know, r to the n is like a power of the height, and we have some constant in front. Um, and so we want to ask when is this prediction true? When does it need to be modified? Just like we can ask in the original case of like projective varieties in the anti-canonical height. Um, and so it turns out that the invariance of the lattice that we can use to determine when this prediction is true is what's called the successive minima of the lattice, which is like a fundamental lattice invariant. And it's defined like this. We'll let uh, lambda r be the least length such that our lattice contains at least r linearly independent vectors of length at most lambda. Um, so another way of saying that is, is lambda one is the length of the shortest non-zero vector of the lattice, which we can call V1. Lambda two is the length of the shortest vector, which is not a multiple of V1. We'll call that vector V2. Lambda three is the length of the shortest vector, which is not a linear combination of V1 and V2, and so on. And so for this reason, lambda R is called the Rth successive minimum. And for us, the really important successive minimum uh, is lambda n, the very last successive minimum. This one will actually tell us, is our prediction true or false? So if lambda n over r is small, then in fact, the number of lattice points in lambda, um, oh, it shouldn't be there, with norm less than x, the norm less than r, is cn times r to the n divided by the volume of the financial domain, with an error term which, which goes to zero as lambda n over r goes to zero. In fact, goes to zero linearly as lambda n over r goes to zero. Um, and so this is something you can check. You can choose your fundamental domain to be a parallel pipette with like vector, with, with sides v1 through vr. You can choose one such centered at each lattice point of the ball, and you can show that these don't overlap and their union is contained in a slightly larger ball and contains a slightly smaller ball. And that will give you some estimate of this form. On the other hand, if lambda n is greater than r, then things start to go bad. By definition, all points on this lattice in the ball of radius r will lie in these subladders generated by the vectors v1 through the n minus 1. So this is a subvariety of x. It's defined by one additional equation. So this is like a thin set. All our points are in a thin set, which is like the opposite of what we want in Manin's conjecture. And then as lambda n over r grows larger and larger, the, the number of points in this ball actually increases. It grows more, more and more greater than what's predicted um, because restricting the lattice to this thin set its co-volume will get smaller and smaller. The density of points will grow and grow as lambda n grows and we keep the volume of the lattice constant. Um, 
So this is the basic dichotomy. The good lattices are the ones where lambda n is much less than r, and the bad ones are ones where lambda n is much greater than r. And if lambda n is close to r, it's kind of, you know, it's on the boundary. To, to be safe, we will want lambda n to be significantly less than r. So we're going to take that dichotomy and now apply it to other varieties that are not just defined by linear equations. So I'm going to first talk about affine varieties and then projective varieties. And then I'll talk about the schematic picture. And in between, I'll give some examples or at least one example. So let's consider now uh, a smooth variety of dimension n in affine space defined by polynomials f1 through fk. And let's take an integer point. We want to apply this same dichotomy to x. So we need to find a lattice, or we need to find a variety with linear equations. Um, so how are we going to make our equations linear? We're going to take the derivative. Um, as I guess you always do in mathematics when you want to make something nonlinear linear. So we're going to define a lattice associated to X to consist of vectors Y in the same vector space with integer coordinates, um, whose dot products with the derivatives of f1 through fk, or the gradients of f1 through fk, all vanish. Um, so we're like, we're like, the equations vanish on f, and we're like looking at them to first order. We're looking at their first derivatives, and we want them, the, the derivatives to vanish also on y. Um, and because x is smooth, by the definition of smooth varieties, the kernel of this is the Zariski tangent space, which is n dimensional. So lambda x is going to be a lattice of rank n. Um, and so in this context, I want to say that x is free if the least successive, last successive minimum of the lattice associated to x um, is at most the norm of x to the power one minus epsilon. So the norm of x is going to play the role of the radius here, um, which I mean makes sense because it is kind of, it's the, the radius of x. Um, and then this is exactly the criterion where we would have good estimates for counting points on um, uh, uh, on lambda x. So if you think about what this does, if you apply it to the case when all the equations really are linear, then we're going to be declaring that these small points with, are, are, are not free, points of small radius are not free, and as the radius grows larger than the last set has a minimum, we're going to declare these points are free. And so the non-free points will be in the range where the conjecture is not holding. And as the radius grows, the free points will be in the range where the conjecture is. Um, so now let's see how to do this for projective space. We're going to apply the same idea, um, but just projectively. So let's fix a smooth variety of dimension n in projective space, which is now defined as projective varieties are by homogeneous polynomials. And let's fix a rational point in our projective space. And let's look at its coordinates, our non-projective variety. Let's look at its coordinates, which we'll again take to be integers with no common factor. So we're going to define a lattice almost the same way. We're going to take the gradient of f1 and fk at x. And we'll take y and zn, whose dot product with f1 through fk is zero, except that we have to mod out by this vector x. So this vector x is always in this kernel. It always has zero dot product with this gradient um, by a property of homogeneous polynomials. If a homogeneous polynomial vanishes at x, then x dot gradient of that polynomial also always vanishes at x. Uh, you can check. So um, you mod out by this vector, which lowers the rank of the lattice by one. Now, when I quotient a lattice by a vector, you might wonder what happens to the lengths of vectors of the lattice. So the length of vectors of the lattice is a very important thing for defining these successive minima, which is what we're going to use. Um, and so 
we can we can define the norm of a vector in this quotient lattice as, as the length of its projection to the orthogonal complement of the vector x. Um, so we, we we can view the quotient lattice as a lattice living in this orthogonal plane to uh, to this vector x, and you project all our integer vectors there. Um, and another way of saying it is you can take your vector y and you look at all the ways of adding a, a real multiple of this vector x and you choose the one of the least length and that's the length of y. So it's like, it's like a minimizing over some kind of cosec if you want to say it like that. So this gives us a lattice, which will again have dimension n uh, and it has a notion of length. And so we can define its successive minimum. Um, and then following almost the definition of para, um, we can say that the point X is free if the nth successive minimum of this lattice is at most the max of the norm of uh, the max of X, or the norm of X or the max of the size of these, these um, coordinates of X raised to the power of one minus epsilon. Uh, where epsilon is something very small, uh, we, we probably want to think about it as an exponent that's going to zero slowly as a function of this norm, uh, but what actually exactly what it is is not incredibly important. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So you said it all falling almost following the definition of pair. So what what was how is pair? Yeah. So pair of? uses this notion of slopes of a lattice, which are slightly more complicated to find, but they have some slightly nicer properties than successive minima. Um, and then they differ by at most a constant factor. And so for our purposes, we can ignore a constant factor. So I made it successive okay. minima for simplicity. Okay. okay, thank you. But if you've heard of slopes or you like slopes, you can use slopes. Um, and so the idea behind this definition is that the unfree points will maybe play the role of a thin set. So the question that he raised in, in his papers about this is if we remove all the non-free rational points, does the asymptotic for Manin's conjecture still hold? Does it, does it work the same as if we remove a thin set? Um, so to make this concrete, I'll give an example. And it'll also, you'll see an example of the case where, where it seems to work. Um, and this will be a cubic surface, uh, which I think already showed up in one of the previous talks. Um, and to make it very concrete, I'll give you a specific cubic surface, which is the one defined by the equation x0 cubed plus x1 cubed plus x2 cubed plus x3 cubed equals zero. Um, so you can calculate the anti-canonical line bundle of a cubic surface is O of one. So the anti-canonical height in this case is simply the maximum of the norms of x0 through x3. Um, and so Menin's conjecture will predict that the number of points of height less than t will be proportional to t times the power of log t, which power depends on exactly which cubic surface. It depends on the, the Picard rank. So in this case, you need a thin set in, in Menin's conjecture, uh, which will consist of all the lines on the cubic surface over the complex numbers. There's 27 lines. Uh, not all of them are likely to be defined over the rational numbers. So we take whichever lines are defined over the rational to be our thin set. Uh, so a fundamental example of a line here for this particular cubic surface is of our four coordinates are a minus a, b minus b. This equation is all already satisfied. And we have two free variables. So that gives a line in protected space. Um, so on this line, the number of points of height less than t is proportional to t squared. So we have t choices of a and t choices for b, which is much, much bigger than t times the power of log t. So there are way more points in this thin set than at solid. So if removing unfree points substitutes for removing the thin set, then all, or maybe almost all, the rational points in this line have to be unfree. Um, so let's look at what freeness means in this case. 
and let's check that these points on this line are in fact not true. So I've, I've written uh, over again our equation, and we're going to look at some point x on this line, which will be a minus a, b minus b. And let's calculate this lattice lambda x. So the equation, once we, di we differentiate this, we get the equation a squared times y1 plus y2 plus b squared times y3 plus y4 is equal to 0. This is an equation in z4, and we mod out by x. So because we're modding out, this is a rank two lattice. And so the way we're going to calculate the freeness, we're going to find, or the successive minima, we're going to find one sub lattice, which contains all the short vectors. So we're going to look at the sub lattice, which is defined by y1 plus y2 equals zero and y3 plus y4 equals zero. So it's certainly true. If those two equations are satisfied, then a squared times y1 plus y2 plus b squared times y3 plus y4 will also equal zero. So the sub lattice contains our lattice. Um, and it contains only one linearly independent vector of mod x. So it looks like it contains two, but once we mod out by x, it'll only contain one. And so what we're going to see is that the points outside this lattice will all have really large norms. Um, so if, if y1 plus y2 and y3 plus y4 are not, not both zero, then looking at this equation, because a and b are relatively prime, y1 plus y2 has to be multiple of b squared, y3 plus y4 has to be multiple of a squared. So y1 plus y2 is at least b squared, and y3 plus y4 is at least a squared. And the minimum length you can achieve with y1 plus y2 at at least b squared and y3 plus y4 at least a squared is when y1 is b squared over 2, y2 is b squared over 2, y3 is a squared over 2, y4 is a squared over 2, which gives this length square root of a to the 4 plus b to the 4 over 2 if you sum up those squares. So the square root of a to the 4 plus b to the 4 over 2 is about the max in size of norm a and norm b um, squared, which is way, way bigger then max a b to the one minus epsilon. Because we take the fourth power in the square root, it's like a square size. It's way, way bigger than the cutoff to be considered a free point. So these points are not free, except possibly if a and b are very small. So we find finally many exceptions. Um, so the freeness does seem to work. Um, and one additional check we can look at, you might want to know what's the other successive minimum of this lattice? What's lambda one? Um, and so what you can do is, is you can calculate what's the generator of the sub lattice. It has to be the form C minus C, D minus D. And it's not so hard to see the generator is the one where AD minus BC equals one. And if you take this vector and you orthogonally project it and you use AD minus BC equals one, then the length of this vector, if I calculate it correctly, is square root of two divided by A squared plus B squared, which is about the inverse of max AB. So the first successive minimum of this lattice is very tiny. It's the inverse of max AB. And the second successive minimum is very large. It's, it's the square of max AB. They're very, very different, which is very, very um, not the behavior of a typical lattice. So this is what you'll see with unfree points. You'll see some small minima and some large. And then the free points, they're going to be more about the same size. Um, this AD, wait, is this, are these A? B of the a squared b squared is it really a b? Which 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 should be a b? Yeah, I know I'm I'm just I'm just trying to so the generator of the sub lattice so we said a d minus b c equal one. Yeah. Is that um, where where does that so we have to project it to the orthogonal complement of a minus a b minus b? Oh okay I see you're pre okay I see you're projecting the orthogonal complement. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so one, one way to calculate that is like you have two vectors in the plane, you're projecting one to the complement of the other. It's like equal to the cross product divided by the length of one of them squared, or the, it's the cross product divided by the, the length of one, I think. So the cross product here is like one or two, and then we divide by the length, which is like a squared plus b squared. I mean, this is probably off by, it may be off by a constant, but yeah, it, it's going to zero very rapidly. 
So I, in the previous slide, slides, I tried to make things very concrete with equations, but some of you also probably like to think of things in terms of schemes. So let me say how to define freeness in terms of schemes. Um, so the nice way to do this is to assume our variety does not just lie over the rational numbers, but in fact spreads out to some kind of nice proper scheme over the integers. Um, and then we need one more piece of data. We want to fix some data at infinity on the real points. And the data we need is a Riemannian metric. Um, it's kind of the Eric Halo of theoretically the right thing. So any rational point on X by the value of criterion of properness extends to a map from spec Z to this scheme curly X. Uh, and the pullback of the tangent bundle of this scheme to spec Z along this map is a vector bundle rank, rank, rank N on spec Z. And vector bundles of rank N on spec Z are the same thing as lattices or free Z modules. And the, excuse me, the Riemannian metric that we fixed defines a metric on this last. Um, um, can I ask you another question? So your 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 curly your your calligraphic X is not is no longer smooth or what? Or um, it? Yeah, so it's it's not necessarily smooth. And then ideally, you want to take it to be regular so that the spec Z points will all go through the smooth points, and therefore the tangent bundle is well defined. But if um, that doesn't work, then you just want to take some vector bundle which happens to equal the tangent bundle on the generic fiber and then that'll okay. be okay. Okay, there's some kind of fake tangent bundle. There. Yeah. Um, so we have a Riemannian metric on the lattice, we can define successive minima. We have a, and we'll say that X is free if the nth successive minimum is at, at most the height of X uh, to the power minus epsilon. So this definition actually matches the previous definition I gave because this pullback of the tangent bundle uh, for a projective variety can be given this explicit formula as the, 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 um, the zero set of the, uh, the, the orthogonal complement of the gradient of these equations, and then you mod out by X. Um, so in particular, if you're just in projective space, I'm saying the tangent bundle of projective space is obtained by taking Zn and like modding out by X. If you remember Jordan's talk, you remember he said the tangent bundle is the orthogonal complement of X in Zn. So that's not correct. That's the cotangent bundle. The tangent bundle is dual to that. Uh, that was important to mention. Um, but I mean, you can do all of this work with the cotangent bundle if you want, you would just end up studying the first successive minimum instead of the last successive minimum. Um, so the skip that we introduced some geometry into the picture. And now for one slide, I want to introduce even more geometry into the picture. Um, and then I'll talk about kind of some of the current research in this area of freeness. So this is, we're going to take advantage of the fact that there's a close analogy between rational points on varieties over Q and rational curves on varieties over finite fields. So you can, you can make the same conjectures in the two settings. You can transfer concepts like height from one to the other, and you can use a lot of the same techniques to answer these conjectures in the two settings. But in the finite field setting, there's more structure. The set of rational curves on a variety isn't just a set, it has geometric structure. It's the set of FQ points of this moduli space of rational curves on it, which is some higher dimensional, more complicated variety. And one of the most basic geometric questions we could ask about this variety is, is it smooth? Or if not, what are the singularities? And you can calculate the singularities using the tangent bundle of the modulated space of rational curves on X, so this is a risky tangent space. And this can be calculated using the tangent bundle on X. There's a, there's a relationship you can prove between the tangent bundle of the modulated space of rational curves on X and the tangent bundle on X. 
Um, and using this relationship, you can show that the smooth points of the modular space of rational curves on X are exactly the points where the tangent bundle, um, the pullback of the tangent bundle, or the, the rational curves that are free um, in something in, in essentially a pair of sets. So where, where the pullback of the tangent bundle has all its slopes uh, at, at least zero, at least minus one. And um, you can set, so it depends on exactly where you set the cutoff epsilon. You can set the cutoff epsilon in the geometric setting at some different fit, different, different values and different cutoffs. So for one cutoff, it corresponds to smooth points of the modulus space of rational curves. For another concept, it corresponds to what are called free rational curves. For another concept, it corresponds to what are called very free rational curves. So Pear's notion is a geometric or is it an arithmetic analog of these concepts of different types of rational curves from geometry that are very important in understanding the geometry of the modulus space of rational curves. So this gives a reason, an additional reason to study freeness, even if we're totally happy with the current formulation of Monin's conjecture, um, or at least if we don't like this modification, we still kind of need to study freeness because it can give us some information about geometry, about moduli spaces of rational curves. And you can actually transfer analytic ideas, you know, arithmetic ideas from the number theory world into new geometric results. Um, so let me now talk about some uh, recent work studying the freeness problem in different cases. So um, I'm first going to talk about the case of hypersurfaces in low degrees of projective space. Um, and so this is joint work I did with Tim Browning, building on um, some work of Birch, which is one of the oldest, but still one of the strongest results known towards Monin's conjecture. So what he proved is if X is a smooth hypersurface of degree D in projective N space, as long as the number of variables is greater than equal to some function of the degree, greater than two to the D times D minus one, that the number of points on X of height at most T is proportional to a constant times T. In other words, Monin's conjecture is true and we don't even need to remove a thin set. Um, so what we proved is that the freeness analog is true in this setting. If we have a smooth hypersurface degree D and PN, as long as N is greater or equal to this 50% larger lower bound, three times two to D minus one times D minus one. Then the number of free points in X of height less than T is proportional to the same constant times T. Um, so in this case, uh, because there's no free set, the, uh, there's no thin set to remove, the thing we have to worry about is that removing unfree points means we're removing way too many points. We're getting overly aggressive, getting rid of rational points, and we get rid of ones we shouldn't have, and we lower the asymptotic number of points too far. Um, so to prove this, we, we use the results of Birch, and after that, it suffices to upper bound the number of unfree points. And to do this, we'll take advantage of of this property of lattices I mentioned earlier, if X is unfree, there's going to be many vectors Y in this lattice uh, with norm associated to X with norm Y less than norm X. So if there's a lot of unfree points, there's a lot of pairs X, Y, where X lies on our hypersurface and where Y lies in this lattice associated to X. So to upper bound the number of free points, we can upper bound the number of pairs X and Y, satisfying the system of equations, F of X equals zero, uh, Y dot norm, norm, Y dot the gradient of F is also equal to zero. And this system of equations now looks very similar to the kind of equations that were studied uh, by Birch. I mean, we're, we have two equations on the set of one, he, he had some results for two equations as well. And we can bound the number of points using the same strategy Birch did, which heavily relied on the circle method. Um, 
and introducing some new ideas to take advantage of the particular structure of this um, system of equations. And these new ideas in particular help us uh, get this lower bound for n down, so it's on, not much larger than the lower bound uh, in an inverse case. Um, so we found a wide class of examples where this freeness idea works, um, and this, this answers a question that was specifically raised by, by Perez. He wanted to know, does this work for hypersurfaces? But unfortunately, I also found a negative example. So the space that this is going to take place on is Hilb to a projected n space, um, which is a resolution of these singularities of its simpler cousin, sim to a projected n space. And so I will tell you or remind you of two constructions of Hilb 2 of Pn. One is as the moduli space of ideal she is on Pn with quotient of length two. Um, and the other uh, is a little bit less general, but more, more concrete, which is we're going to take Pn cross Pn, a product. We're going to take the diagonal Pn inside Pn cross Pn and blow it up. And then we're going to look at the action of Z mod two on this blow up, switching the two copies of Pn, and we'll quotient by that action to produce help two Pn. Um, so Manning's conjecture for help two Pn was proven by Le Rodelier. And in that case, the thin set is the image of this blow. So it's all the points that lift to this degree two covering, which includes the points on, on the diagonal. So I raise this question, can removing unfree points for substitute for removing this thin set in help to project this space? Um, and the answer is no. In fact, most, a positive proportion of points in this thin set are free. Um, and so, how am I going to prove that? How am I going to show that these points in the thin set are free? What we're going to do is start on the projective space cross projective space. Um, and this is one of the cases that was handled by Pear. He did what we did for hypersurface in the last slide. He showed that most rational points on this space are free. And so what we want to do is check this freeness is preserved as we travel first along the blow up map and then along the degree two cover. The, the, the tangent lattice doesn't change very much in some kind of precise sense. Um, so there's like a key lemma, which shows that the tangent lattice doesn't change as we pull back along a blow up map and as we push forward along this degree two covering. And in fact, it works for any kind of generically finite map as long as we avoid the branch divisor. Um, and so we show that the tangent lattice doesn't change uh, very much. And so that implies the successive minima doesn't change very much. The height, uh, which can be calculated from the tangent lattice, doesn't change very much. And so the freeness, which depends on the successive minima and the height, also doesn't change very much as we travel from Pn cross Pn to this blow up to help two. Um, and so because most of the points were very free before, they remain quite free uh, after. Um, so you might ask at this point, like, why did I tell you all this stuff if it doesn't work? Well, the reason is because it, 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 it doesn't completely fail either. So we saw uh, early in the talk that there's two different kinds of thin sets. There's special subvarieties and there's covering. Uh, and as far as I can see, freeness does work to substitute for the notion of thin sets when you're getting rid of special sub rights, like these lines on the cubic surface. But it doesn't always work when you have to get rid of special coverings. Um, so it works for kind of half of the problem. Um, and interestingly, Pear has another proposal, which I would love to talk about in this talk, but I don't have enough time to, which is called the all the heights approach. <laughs> 
And that approach should work for all the thin sets, coverings of degree grade equal to two, but not for all the special subvarieties. Um, so as far as I can see, it's completely possible that combining the two approaches gives a good alternative formulation of Bernese conjecture as a like actually correct statement. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that I think freeness is still worth thinking about in addition to its applications to geometry that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so we're asked to speak about open questions during this talk. And the whole talk was about an open question, Mann's conjecture and variance of the conjecture, but these are really hard open questions. I don't think you should necessarily sit down and start working on trying to prove these conjectures. So I formulated some open questions that are at least a little bit easier than these ones. Um, and so the first open question is can we come up with any new strategies to count unfree points to understand for new types of varieties how many points are not free so the main strategies i'm aware of are the first one that i explained in this work of, of, of browning and myself which is to bound the number of pairs x y where y lies in the tangent lattice of x um, which works in particular for varieties that are very, very fun of, kind of, like the um, low degree hypersurface and projective spaces. Their anti-canonical bundle is like very, very high power of, of, of an ample line bundle. And a second um, is, is, was in this recent work of Browning, Horish, and Welsh, where they give a very explicit description of lambda x in, uh, for a specific variety, the Grossmannian, which parameterizes lattices. And so because the Grossmannian parameterized lattices, you might think there's a nice way to describe the tangent lattice in terms of these lattices. And you can do that, and then you can use equidistribution results for lattices to count the unfree points, uh, which you know, works great for these kinds of very special varieties, but probably doesn't generalize to like an arbitrary finite variety. So it'd be great to have more ideas that maybe can work in new cases. Um, and more, um, more precisely, one thing that would be very cool to have is an example where counting free points is easier than counting all rational points. So currently, all these examples for counting free points, proving asymptotic for the number of free points, begins by using a pre-existing work to count all rational points, and then by a separate argument counting the ones that are not free and subtract tracting them off. And the separate argument is usually harder than the original argument. So, um, but in principle, there's nothing preventing an argument which directly counts the free points, which maybe could work in some cases where we don't know how to count rational points. So I think this is very hard, but it would be very cool to have. Um, maybe I'll mention that this all the heights approach, this isn't a problem. So like freeness is a version of minus conjecture is usually harder to prove than the original version of minus conjecture. For the all the heights approach, this isn't true as well as much. And oftentimes what you can see is people were really doing this implicitly when they're when they proving some cases. Um, okay, but both of these problems are, are, are very hard. So I tried to come up with some problems that would give us like uh, maybe a concrete way to attack and kind of get some intuition on this. Um, and so the first thing is, can we get numerical answers to questions about, about unfree points. So the main questions you'd want to know is like how many unfree points are there on some fauna variety and how are they distributed? Are they are clustered together or are they evenly distributed um, on any kind of fauna variety of interest. So one could look at varieties which do have uh, exceptional subvarieties to remove, varieties which don't have exceptional subvarieties, varieties where monic conjecture is known, where it's not known, different cases, try to understand what's going on with unfree points and, and try to get uh, some intuition. Um, and then the, the last question is to try to do the same thing from a, from a very different angle. So instead of the numerical angle, try to get intuition from understanding a special cases in the geometric angle. And so um, 
this, when I say this will not make sense to, to, to most people, but I, I want to say anyways, like there is a, there are geometric versions of modern conjecture, which focus on the cohomology of the moduli space of free curves on X. And they predict the cohomology should match cohomologies of um, topological objects, like some kind of loop space parameterizing smooth spheres in X. Um, and so the question is, which version of the moduli space of curves on X matches most closely the cohomology of this moduli space of spheres? You can take the moduli space of all curves, you can take the moduli space of free curves. When you're taking all curves, you can use the ordinary cohomology or compactly supported cohomology or intersection cohomology. You have choices. And to see in some explicit case, which is complicated enough that there are some singularities, but simple enough that you can actually do this cohomology, what the cohomology is of these different options and which one matches better, maybe would give us a clue to what's going on in general. Okay, that's all I have to say. Thank you for inviting me to speak. Thank you so much, Will. So let's start with some questions. I can start with a quick question. Uh, throughout the talk, you worked over uh, over Q, but I wondered if that was just a simplification and whether this works over any number field or whether there are some subtleties when you go to more complicated fields. Um, no, I don't think there's any subtleties. Uh... Some of these results are not proven over number fields because we also want to simplify things when writing them down, but I, I think it should all, it should all work the same. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, yeah. look, Bjorn has a question. Oh, yeah, okay. And, and going, going back to your work here with Browning about the, the, the free point version of, of Birch's result. Um, so, I mean, I noticed you have to take N, um, I guess, 50% larger than yeah. than it was before. I mean, is that just an artifact of the proof you think, or is, I mean, well, do you, do you really this, expect that to this be- This number two to the D times D minus one is- Yeah, that's, very, that's much larger than what, than what you should have, right, yeah. But, uh, um, yeah, so, so, so even for Birch's theorem, nobody predicts that this theorem should fail for N equal to two to the D times D minus one minus one. Yeah. Like we believe yeah. it should work down to much smaller values of, of, of D. Um, yeah, I guess my question maybe is then, do you, do you expect that the bound for which Birch's theorem works to be, I mean, in the, do, you, do you expect that the truth is that, that, the, that for the free, counting three points, you'll, it'll, it'll be the same bound that works there for as in Birch's? Well, it could maybe be better because one of the things that could go wrong when you're trying to prove uh, Birch's theorem in very low degree, we can make it false by choosing a side presurface that contains an exceptional subvariety. We choose oh, a side presurface that okay. contains a linear space of high dimension. We can make the asymptotic for counting rational points not quite right. And oh, freeness so, so you, will so get rid of the linear theorem, space right? for counting free points. So you're improving a better theorem. We should have a smaller, smaller bound. In so your, the problem your, is, your yes, so the problem is, is it's an artifact of the method. It's an artifact specific of the fact that we have to reduce the problem to counting these pairs. So the unfree points are, are kind of bad and we get rid of them. We should have a better asymptotic. But the actual method is to count these pairs. And by counting pairs, we're actually enhancing the contribution of the unfree points. We're like maximizing the contribution of the unfree points. So that's why we make things worse and not better. Um, but we have to do that to apply the circle method. So that's why I don't know how to improve this. So there's no hope of, of just applying, going through the proof of this, the, the circle method proof of Birch, but just, just keeping track of the free points as you go along. Yeah, it's not. And the reason is when you're doing the circle method, you don't keep track of like the whole equation at once. So the circle method is about these exponential sums and each exponential contains a little bit of the information contained in the equation. And so you're summing the circle method, when you sum, you sum the Tobin circle method, are sums over many points 
Most of them do not lie on your variety. So you have all these points that don't lie on your variety. And what's the notion of freeness for points which are not on your variety? It seems very hard. So I, I don't know how to get rid of the non-free points uh, in these kinds of sums. Okay, I see. Thank, thank you. Great, let's see other questions. I think David Corwin had a question in the chat. He asked whether the version over number fields might be a special case of an equivariant version applied to the vague restriction. Uh, I don't know if you even need equivariant. I think a lot of times, yeah, for a lot of these conjectures, doing it over number fields is equivalent to doing it for the Vey restriction over Q. And I would expect that's probably true here as well. Yeah, sounds right to me. Bind over that number field rather than, you know, over Q in the V restriction. I didn't hear the first part of that. Sorry, the, the, the equivariance would be if you sort of really want your, your thin sets to be defined over that um, number field. Well, what you could do, because the thin set is defined geometrically, oh. the value restriction is geometrically a product. And probably you can check, I'm not sure, but I hope you can check that the LST construction of a thin set is compatible with products in a suitable way. Um, okay, yes, that does make sense. Uh, I actually have another question. Sure. Um, so I, I've seen a bit of like, like Manin's height zeta functions. Um, and like the, the, you look at the region of convergence sort of as a way to, to see whether some sub variety, you know, has more or fewer points. So like in, in that lattice model with the lambda R's, like, can you do something with, with sort of, I guess a height zeta function would be sort of, you know, just something over integer points and weighted by the, the, the norm. Yeah. So the. The zeta function, like th th this phenomenon for lattices, I'm probably not going to go away. This phenomenon for lattices is a transient phenomenon. So it depends on R. So if you do some zeta function, which incorporates information about all R simultaneously, it'll be probably dominated by the large values of R, and you won't see this weird phenomenon that happens with small R. So what happens on a variety, a projective variety, is as you move from one point to the next, the lattices keep getting worse. So the R you care about is growing, but the lattices, their successive minima are also growing. And it's like the quest contest of like who grows first. Uh, so okay. seeing asymptotics for like an individual point is not going to give you clues about the asymptotics for the whole space for that reason. Got it. And that's a nice segue to um, an announcement of our, our next talk, which is uh, not in two weeks, but in one week by Chinko on height zeta functions. So I um, hope you'll all be able to come to that. <laughs>